Here's another example. This is um, C here. We've got another left bundle inferiorly directed. Um, but uh, if you notice, we have a very early transition here, sort of like what we uh, were seeing in V2. Um, but lead three is not very positive. So we're not as high up in the heart as we were before. And this some sort of disparity in the amplitude between lead two and lead three in the limb leads um, really is unique to the parahisian region and, and worth pointing out. Again, an inferiorly directed left bundle PVC, but this one has a very late transition. We can compare that to that um, RVOT PVC that we saw in the earlier panel. Um, we're seeing much more negativity up here. Um, it's probably hidden underneath that thing um, for the zoom controls, but much more negativity in lead one and a very late transition. And that's going to be your anterior RVOT. So we've moved over to the left side when we're more anterior and they tend to be broader because they're not engaging that interventricular septum as easily. So there are more examples on there. And the other region that really bears um, some unique discussion, and I know it's a standalone lecture, but I couldn't possibly uh, discuss PVC ablation since this is where the bulk of my ablations end up being. I end up doing a lot of redo and sometimes redo procedures um, from other electrophysiologists, and it tends to be the LV summit that's giving people trouble. So it's either giving them pause because of the proximity of the coronary arteries, or just an inability to ablate because you aren't able to get down onto that muscle. So we define the LV summit um, as the region of tissue, um, sort of the LV tissue that's above the plane of the aortic valve itself and bounded uh, by uh, the region uh, crossing over of the great cardiac vein into the anter anterior interventricular vein. Um, and bounded again by the bifurcation of the left main into the circumflex and LAD. So we've, we've got some important neighbors when we're in this area. It's an area that you can see would be covered with epicardial fat were we to be in the epicardial space. So this really is an area that essentially is um, nearly inaccessible for um, ablation from standard percutaneous epicardial access and you guys um, have um, uh, access to a electron epicardial anatomy that I think goes through this really nicely as well. One unique area in the septum, uh, sorry, in the um, LV summit is uh, the anterior interventricular sulcus uh, itself. So words that maybe we haven't really uh, used very often in common conversation in general cardiology, but become really important when we're trying to ablate here. So this is sort of the divot, if you will, um, when you remove the epicardial fat between the RV and the LV. And these are uh, those beautiful models um, from the UCLA group, but um, being used in a pen group a publication from JCE, talking about this unique um, finding um, in these patients, V2, in the same way we talked about V1, but V2 will be right over this area. So if you were to take a needle and stab someone in the chest right underneath V2 or do a CT scan while they were wearing EKG leads, you'd see that this, this lead has a perfect view of this outflow tract right up at this sulcus. And because of that, you have what is termed a pattern break in V2 here. So overall left bundle morphology, meaning overall uh, negativity in V1, um, but we uh, transition to more negative in V2 and then become positive again in V3. And so here's a couple examples of this. They tend to be very high up and somewhat leftward of midline. So we're gonna have that negativity in lead one. This is an important group to look at because we tend to have difficulty ablating this. We're limited by proximity to the LED when we're in the coronary venous tree or epicardially, and our success is lower in this region. So important to counsel your patients uh, going in and understand your limitations going in. Okay, let's get to some ablations in our remaining 20 minutes here. So how are we gonna get the patients to the lab? First off, you have to have that 12 lead for all the reasons that we've just talked about. And I really encourage you to run a rhythm strip. So get to know your um, EKG text. They should know that you want um, a 12 lead EKG and you want a rhythm strip. It's okay to waste paper, trust me. 
Um, this is really important. Um, if you're doing this for device um, patient, you may also run intracardiacs and kind of match that up, see which one is which. Certainly this is very important in the PVC triggered VF patients. Um, uh, you need a Holter monitor, you need to know what you're starting with, and some sort of substrate evaluation. So at a minimum, these folks should have some sort of echocardiogram. We should know what their um, ejection fraction is, and I would ar argue that most patients should go on to have a cardiac MRI looking for sort of occult LGE and the risk of sudden death there. Um, in terms of Holter, I think it's important to do longer term monitoring. So this was an interesting study. I think it was about 500 patients, and they saw that folks who ultimately went on to have at least 10% PVCs in the red or even 20% in the green, they didn't necessarily manifest that high uh, number in the first 24 hours. So there is um, benefit here to moving past. Um, we tend to do seven day um, monitors, patch monitors, or at least 48 hours at the minimum. Uh, you can see there is that uptick as you continue to um, go forward, so some variation there. So you've decided to take the patient to the lab and oops, they left their PVCs at home. So I tell the patients when I'm talking about the procedure that this is one of the ways in which we end up not being successful. So um, you're sitting there at the pre-procedure area with them and or you've already brought them into the lab and they happen to disappear. So what went wrong? Um, what I find uh, most frequently is that there was some failure in the medications. Um, so either the patient didn't understand their instructions or they decided to continue taking their medications because of symptoms. You really do need at least two or three days in sort of your standard BID medicines like beta blockers and um, class 1Cs to let that wear off. Um, uh, underestimating the uh, menstrual cycle components. And again, if you've done longer term monitoring, that may help you get a hint of that or done a more careful history. Um, illicit and non-illicit drug use. Um, I practice in Washington State, and I have to say, um, it's not infrequent that my patients use marijuana before the procedures because they are nervous. Um, and that tends to make PVCs go away. Um, we don't know if it's a therapy for PVCs long-term because we're really not uh, uh, privy to very much um, uh, investigational data on this, but it, it does happen more than I would like. Um, and some patients will have a sleep cycle change. So your patients that work a swing shift or a night shift, maybe they didn't go to work that day and they actually got a better night's sleep. Um, so on that end, what can you do? You can rebook them <laughs> and tell them to get a terrible night's sleep. Um, really making sure that your anesthesiologist or your nurses aren't sneaking any of those for sedin fentanyl. So I'm surprised at how often I say no for sedin fentanyl and they've gotten just 25 mics or just 50 mics and two milligrams really important to not give these longer term acting drugs. You can use isopril, IV calcium. We have some success with phenylephrine. Uh, another thing to remember once you're in the case is ventricular pacing may bring out PVCs and even physical mapping in the area may sort of wake the area up, if you will. But some patients atrial pacing can bring it on. And then pace mapping um, as a final uh, sort of um, uh, last resort. If you really are unable to get the PVCs going and unable to do any activation mapping at all, if you have a PVC 12 lead with the leads in the identical position, and you sometimes can put a patient on a treadmill and do that, have them actually wear um, the EKG labs, uh, uh, sorry, EKG leads from the EP lab um, and go from that. Okay, so we finally got a patient to the lab uh, in our final 15 minutes here. So 27 year old woman, She's got peripartum cardiomyopathy, um, which was diagnosed uh, five years ago, actually. And she was referred to me, this was in my first job in Chicago, for an ICD. And I was looking through and everyone kept saying she was on optimal medical therapy, but really she was only on carvedilol six and a quarter and she was limited by bradycardia, interestingly. She was actually pretty symptomatic still. New York Heart Association class three and her EF was less than 30%. And they were even thinking that she was gonna need to go on for advanced therapies. And this was her EKG. And when I looked through her records, this had been her EKG for five years. Um, so we have, again, a very inferiorly directed PBC. We're very positive in lead one. And we have a relatively early transition in V3, although the sinus also um, uh, transitions early um, with, uh, a noticeable, although not overwhelmingly prominent, R wave in V2 for the PVC. 
So I was already thinking that this was coming somewhere from the left side. So how do I um, uh, go about this for this patient? So I did an MRI for her and there was no delayed enhancement, just dilation, which was pretty significant and corroborated on her echo. Um, and the mo Holter monitor showed 38% monomorphic PVCs matching the one we saw in clinic. So I decided that it really wasn't appropriate to sort of mess around with antiarrhythmics necessarily in this patient, that we really needed to try and go after this because I felt like it was coming from an accessible area. I don't think it was be at all appropriate to put an ICD in this patient. We haven't done everything to improve her ejection fraction. Um, the other question became, was this a chicken and egg problem? I get asked this a lot. Um, and it depends on how you look at it, but alpha tract PVCs uh, do not tend to be a, um, a uh, effect, if you will, of cardiomyopathy. To say it another way, um, folks with cardiomyopathy do not tend to have PVCs because they have cardiomyopathy, but rather the other way around. So morphology is really important. So whenever somebody tells me they're sending me somebody with PVCs, I'm always wanting to know the morphology. And uh, the answer is often, well, I don't know, that's for you to do, um, but it is for us to do. And the, those alpha tract tachycardias or alpha tract uh, PVCs should really catch your eye. So I brought her to the lab and the anesthesiologist got really nervous because they had their pulse thing set to the arterial line or actually the pulse ox. Um, and what you saw was her bradycardia, her sort of pseudo bradycardia, if you will, um, where we would see no um, uh, perceivable um, uh, pulse amplitude after the PVC beat. So really she was sort of running on half uh, speed there. Um, I didn't hold the carvedilol for days in advance because she had this very high burden and I was worried about precipitating heart failure in her actually. I used propofol for access and um, really important, we should all be doing ultrasound guidance for groin access anyway, but it helps you avoid infiltration of lidocaine inadvertently. So this was sort of a standard ablation. I had the MRI, I brought it into the Insight system. I don't tend to use a multipolar catheter for these. I find that the multipolar catheters, even the, the HD grid, which is fairly gentle, although you get gorgeous signals, you still have to get your ablation catheter there and figure out if you're in the same exact spot or not, which isn't always uh, straightforward. Um, and that those multipolar catheters tend to cause more ectopy and I have difficulty adjudicating whether or not I've caused catheter ectopy with a multipolar catheter than with a single ablation catheter. Um, other people do use those and I think they're interesting research tools to be looking at, um, um, at uh, arrhythmogenesis and questions that way. But from a practical standpoint, I'm, it's pretty stripped down for me. I'm going to use an ultrasound catheter and an ablation catheter. And for a case like this, I will get arterial access up front. I'm not going to waste my time on it. So we were thinking because we were so positive in lead one and had that early transition that we were going to be ending up in the cusp. And sure enough, we were. So this was her clinical PVC in the lab. Um, this was pace mapping from the right cusp. Um, and in the more modern verbiage, I would have gotten, you know, a 97% match or something. But in our sort of qualitative uh, verbiage, you can see that all the nooks and crannies are the correct direction. And even the sort of more isoelectric leads are matching up. I tend to find that those isoelectric leads get switched very easily if you're not in the right spot. And my uh, distal ablation signal, kind of funny, nice and low amplitude here, was 30 milliseconds out in front. So when I look at the anatomy here and use the MRI, I had the overlapping RV, RV here. If I strip that away, um, I also mapped the um, great cardiac vein here, as you can see. And we were reasonably early in the great, great cardiac vein, but earlier in that right cusp, even though they're pretty far away, there's some preferential um, activation, it seems, towards that left, um, as also shown in the 12 lead EKG. And ablation here in the cusp eliminated the PVC and her LV remodeled and our ejection fraction got back up to 55% over the uh, few years that I was there. So this was a really important case. So when you're ablating in the cusps and um, Dr. Asavatham went through this in his lectures, you're not truly ablating cusp tissue, right? I think this uh, sort of cutaway view really says it the best. You are ablating at the top of the septum, the top of the LV, the most basal portion of the left ventricle where it abuts the leaflets. So here's a sort of curled up um, uh, coronary cusp, uh, or sorry, uh, aortic leaflet here. 
Um, and remembering that your coronary arteries are gonna be coming off in the middle of the sinus where the sinuses are the deepest, where your catheter really should be sort of at the bottom of the sinus anyway. So you're generally not really close to the uh, coronary ostea. So I often get asked, um, when do you do an angiogram uh, during a PVC ablation? And my sort of obvious answer is when you're close to the arteries. And um, from that anatomical description here, I don't feel like we're generally uh, very close in the coronary arteries. And if you go back and you look at all your angiograms that you did as a fellow, um, you'll see that when you're shooting those coronaries and there's reflux into the cusps, there's quite a bit of distance, usually greater than a centimeter there. So I don't routinely do that. I visualize, especially the left coronary ostium um, on uh, ice before I'm ablating and making sure I'm lower. You generally don't record an electrogram when you're too high. Um, so there's no reason to be in there. However, that's very different in the LV summit, um, right? And um, uh, if you're in the great cardiac vein, especially if you come around to the AIV, you're by necessity probably crossing over some arteries. And so it's important that you look here. Um, this is a nice example of this. This is a 42-year-old man with a dilated cardiomyopathy, low EF, very high frequency PVCs. You can see again, we've got that inferiorly directed PVC quite wide. We're negative in lead one, so we're somewhere over on the left or, uh, leftward side of the heart. And when we look at the percordial leads, we see something that should make, make you say, well, this might be a long day. I already knew it would be a long day because I was the third electrophysiologist to try this. But we have a very broad R wave here, right? So more than 50% of the QRS um, is uh, positively deflected in V1. Um, I mapped both the right cusp, the left cusp, um, the LVOT itself, and the RVOT. I was very late in all of those except for the right cusp but I was essentially right on time with the QRS. And what does that mean? It means you're not sitting on the tissue that's, um, that's firing off and creating that QRS. Um, you're somewhere remote from it. You may be um, at the most accessible site from your uh, catheter standpoint, but you're not sitting right on that orienting muscle. And the pace maps in that whole region were poor. So I went ahead and I mapped the coronary sinus and I included this um, image here showing an agilis catheter kinked at the ostium of the coronary sinus, which happens more than I would like. Um, but I've delivered this into the coronary sinus and I'm injecting contrast through it. You can also inject contrast through the ablation catheter itself. Um, I generally mix it a little bit. It's hard to push through very much um, through those irrigated catheter holes, which are pretty small. But I like to do this kind of image before I go sort of aggressively mapping in the more proximal coronary, or sorry, distal coronary sinus here. Um, so that I, I'm not over aggressive with how far back over to the right hand side that I push. So it helps me delineate sort of the, the margins there. It's not always clear from your 3D electroanatomic mapping how far you can go. So when I got out, um, sorry, this is from the right cusp, just illustrating that on timeness, if you will. So um, I've included the unipolar electrogram here, and this is a very key component for mapping these PVCs. If you're right at the site of origin, your unipolar electrogram should be a relatively brisk downstroke with no positivity, right? Makes sense. Like you're at the site, all the action should be away from you if you're sitting there as a unipole. So even though all the action, if you will, was away from the right coronary cusp, I was not very early on the initiation of the PVC. And it turned out we really didn't end up being very early anywhere for this um, particular patient. Um, I had my best pace maps, which we ended up using a lot in this case. So I had my best pace maps in the proximal um, anterior interventricular vein. So when I was in the distal uh, coronary sinus without sort of making that turn, I had too much positivity in lead V1 and maybe even some uh, sort of unusual findings with the capture um, in lead one. But if I got out that proximal AIV, um, I got that positivity in V1 that I was looking for, but also that negativity. So sometimes I'll use this sort of comparison. The, the system will give you percentage matches, but that's not really what you're after. It's not that this was 87 and this one was 92. It's the quality of it. So you need to train your eyes. And I'll actually, on the live screen in Pruka, have these be different colors. So because I was at that transition point, I did do an angiogram. And I also don't like it when they move 
um, the, the table with my, um, you know, Cardo magnet underneath. So I ended up with these standard RAO and LAO views. And it's a little bit hard to see, but it takes, uh, you know, it takes really scrutinizing these. You can see in the REO that you've got the LED coming anteriorly and that there's a large bifurcation here of a diagonal. And my tip of my catheter, at least an REO, is right at it. And when we come over to the LAO, we've got the circ sort of ghosting in behind and then that large branch, you can see I'm sitting right on it. So if I'm out further where I had that better pace map, I'm sitting right on the artery. So obviously we can't ablate there. So we pull back and we surround it. So we pull back there, we, we ablate endocardially um, and we ablate more proximally. And that's really as good as we can get. And this was using half normal saline at that more proximal site, distinctly being back. So I had a, a worse pace map, um, but using that half normal saline, trying to get a deeper lesion, which is a, an argument in and of itself, um, knowing that I was ablating on the myocardium and not up against that artery. Um, how can you set yourself back here in the final moments um, of the talk here with uh, mapping during PVC ablation? And I think Ed Gersenfeld gave a nice um, mapping lecture on how to use the system. But um, ways in which in PVC ablation in particular things can go awry. If you choose a bad reference or if your mapper chooses a bad reference, it's going to be a long day. Um, and so an example of that would be uh, choosing a V5 here where you have sort of a double notch as they go past, is the system updating at the same point in the PVC? Um, Technology is really helping us move past these limitations, but there's still um, some manual uh, sort of decision-making behind the scenes that can affect the course of your case. Um, in the ESI system, we use a 12 lead match. So you really have to match all those 12 leads in terms of morphology, but there's still a timing reference, right? So V2 in this instance, it was the negative coach portion of V2. So learn your systems and what they're actually doing. And I think PVC ablation in particular can point out some of the problems here. Um, that was a RV floor. Um, mapping catheter ectopy, and this is sort of uh, getting used to it. This is uh, a patient who had single PVCs and then suddenly we're in the region of interest getting nice um, <clears throat> morphologies here. And this is on a papillary muscle. Um, but we've got um, a very, very early signal. And you have to think to yourself uh, that this is probably too early, okay? Varying annotation, this is a big one for me. So automatic mapping systems uh, still need some manual adjudication. So where in the unipolar, where in the bipolar uh, signal is it being annotated? You don't need a million points, right, for PVC ablation. You need um, a couple dozen really good ones in the area of interest. So here's an example where we were in the RBOT here and with one particular annotation, it looked like we were um, uh, pretty early here, whereas in the coronary sinus, we looked like we were pretty late. But you can see the coronary sinus is being sort of preferentially annotated a little bit later. If we moved that coronary sinus annotation forward, now the CS was the place to be. And pace maps had looked pretty good in both sites in that particular instance. Um, inventing early signals. Here's an example on a pat muscle where I'm like, oh cool, I've got a fascicular potential here before the QRS. Um, but turns out if I'm really looking at the whole strip, that potential isn't there with every uh, PVC beat and it's sort of here, there and everywhere. We all have noisy labs and there's lots of structures that you're intervening, especially if you're in the papillary muscle, if you're through the mitral leaflets, you're through cordae um, and you're um, potentially through the aortic valve as well. And those mechanical events can create pseudo electrical signals. So training your eye to see those, I think are really important. Um, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. So there's the example. Um, another way to say this is hope is for fools, or as my friend Jen Silva says, there are no hope burns. So she's a pediatric electrophysiologist and that's really important when you're talking about pathways. Um, Underappreciation of map dislocation with ectopy. And Nishant, I've got about five more minutes. If that's okay, you let me know. Yeah, um, sorry? I said that's fine. Perfect. Um, I know that uh, Sam Astrobatham went for like five hours, um, one of the early ones so, for anatomy. Um, but this, this last point is really important. And this is a really cool study out of the Barcelona group um, where they mapped both in sinus rhythm and the PVCs.
and they're mapping both the anatomy as well as the activation. And this is point by point mapping. So you're not doing um, FAM or geometry collection where it's wherever the catheter goes. There's, I'm only going to make geometry when I'm there during this beat. Oops. And um, you can see that when we look at the shells of, uh, sorry, in the right hand column here, when we look at the shells in sinus and purple and the PVC map in uh, green, they don't overlap perfectly. And there's a reasonable amount of displacement, especially in the free wall of the right ventricle. But really importantly, the earliest activation sites um, get annotated completely differently. So this ended up being the successful ablation site. And if it, you're on an activation map that's populated only in sinus rhythm by ge on geometry that's populated only, sorry, during PVCs and populated only uh, on geometry uh, during PVCs, you're sort of right where you'd expect at that earliest activation point. But in sinus rhythm, that point was translocated about a full centimeter. This is really important and something that I underappreciated for many years when I was ablating um, and I really pay attention to now. So the mapping system is really just a notepad for you, right? And if you're taking notes on things that aren't the right thing, um, you will end up with confusing maps. Um, I liked this other image from that paper. I'm ghosting in here. You can really see that translocation um, in sinus rhythm. And uh, another aspect of that to think about is if you're doing peso mapping correlation maps, say you're not having frequent ectopy, those will be different than the site of activation during the PVC. So you sort of have to reconcile that in your head. I don't generally do two separate maps, but I will, I will watch the catheter translocate during pace mapping or translocate during the PVCs and think to myself, okay, I'm going to this site in PVCs, but in sinus, I always ended up over here, a centimeter over, let's say. Um, and so when you ablate and you're successful and you get rid of PVCs, it means you can never get back to that exact site unless you also knew where it was in sinus rhythm, right? Can't do your insurance burns if you didn't uh, keep track of that. Um, lastly, another sort of big concept, um, and this is the last uh, sort of point here, just a really beautiful article out of the UAB group now over a decade old as well. Um, and they were looking at preferential conduction across this outflow track. This is such a unique area of the heart and is really confusing, honestly, for the beginning mapper um, because we tend to think about conduction as uniform uh, when you first start learning about it but they were looking at right ventricular as well as left ventricular outflow track uh, sort of breakthroughs. And what they found were different patterns. So this is a left coronary cusp PVC, uh, successfully ablated from the left coronary cusp. And there's the apparent insulation around these myocardial fibers. So the origin may be right at the cusp, but the breakout site where you would have early activation may be in the RVOT. If you pace mapped in the RVOT, it would look terrible, right? Because it wouldn't at all, um, sorry, it would look wonderful um, in this example because that is the breakout. We're not getting out towards the left side in this particular example. If you pace map from the left coronary cusp itself where activation should be a lot earlier, you get a great pace map. You may have some latency on that pace map because of this insulation here. Um, and if you have to pace at higher output, you may get some preferential conduction more leftward where we don't get that with the spontaneous ectopy. You may be capturing some muscle cells just a little bit beyond that. So you're having to integrate the anatomy as a really uh, big component here, um, activation as well as pace mapping and recognizing that it's not as simple as best pace map, best timing. There's some overlap here because of these insulating fibers. And they go through some other examples of more complex um, arrangements. This is even worse in this area if you're doing redo procedures. And that also means redo mapping during your own procedure. So lots of mapping before you come on RF the first time is important. The saving grace is that we may do very fine-tuned mapping and we still honestly with good force um, are, and irrigated tip catheters are able to do a lot of destruction in the area. Um, also a humbling thing when you think about the, the salmon colored arteries that we're right next to. Um, but we're often able to overcome sort of this confusion by essentially doing a, our nice big lesion. It's not very sophisticated. 
So I'm going to skip that last example and go on to my summary slide here. So um, really prep yourself for success. Rule out structural heart disease are my um, sort of final tips. Catalog your morphologies. Have a mapping plan. Know um, uh, how you're going to set up your map. And then test your work when you're done with high dose isoprel and a reasonable waiting period. Those of us who feel constantly rushed, um, you know, this is a hard one to rush, especially if, if your PVC went away after your fifth ablation lesion, you need to wait. And sometimes you need to wait an hour. You don't want it to come back while they've pulled sheaths. It's really not a great day. Scrutinize your map setup. Um, avoid that map bloat and wander that can happen with taking points in both sinus um, and with PVCs. And be tenacious with safety, especially in that outflow tract area and with the coronary arteries. Um, no hope burns, as I just said, and um, really important. I said it earlier in the slide, but live to fight another day on these. Nobody dies of PVCs in and of themselves. So this isn't ventricular tachycardia, and I think our burden for safety should be higher in these cases. Um, and, uh, and I would leave you with that. Um, it, it's okay to not be successful. So thank you, and thank you so much, Nishant, for uh, letting me do this, even though it's very early. <laughs> That was an incredible lecture. Thank you for that. Um, maybe I'll ask a couple questions here because people are clearly trying to work through their management of these. Um, what this was asked the other night, but what burden, PVC burden, are you comfortable taking to the lab? When do you think it's just a waste of time to bring the person in? Yeah, and I had included a slide and took it out at the beginning. You know, I have taken people with a burden as low as 1% if there is some proof that it's adrenaline driven. Um, so either treadmill or when you're looking on their Holter monitor or, you know, that it's with activity. And those tend to be your really highly symptomatic patients and you're going in eyes wide open. Um, if you don't see a PVC with isopril, you're not opening the mapping system, you know, patches, you're not opening the ablator. Um, you may give the isopril in the holding area before you actually bring them back. Um, but we have to have something. So I think the burden can be low. Those patients should be highly symptomatic and, and probably unresponsive to medications um, because the chance that you're going to have um, not just difficulty having something to pace map or certainly activation map, but also not having a great endpoint, right? So if their PVCs come and go anyway during the day and have that, there, it's not usually a uniform 1%, you know, every hundredth beat is a PVC. It's that they come and go for sometimes hours at a time and that may encompass the time you're in the lab and you may pat yourself on the back and they come right back. So that's a non-answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like it when it's more like at least 10%. Right. And the chicken or the egg question here, multifocal PVCs with LV dysfunction, do you ever medically manage rather than take them to the lab to make sure that the PVCs are the cause? Yeah, absolutely. And I think in that context, the medical management is amiodarone, right? So most of those patients really aren't uh, candidates for class 1C agents. Um, I don't find that Sotolol is as safe as we'd like it to be in cardiomyopathy patients, especially ones with SCAR. They don't tolerate it as well. So it's usually amiodarone. So if your patient's willing to do a trial of amiodarone, that may give you um, sort of that push to bring them to the lab. If their PVCs are from idiopathic regions, I still may primarily go in for ablation. Um, and see what we're left with. So if it's outflow tract and pat muscle, that seems to be a combo that goes together a lot in those patients, I will bring them. If it's consistent with their scar in a, in a ischemic cardiomyopathy patient, I will bring them. I'm less excited about that in the non-ischemic, the sarcoids, the lamins, et cetera. The efficacy really does start to decrease, but that's a good strategy for sure. And then uh, along those lines, there was a question about um, using class 1Cs for presumed PVC-induced cardiomyopathy in idiopathic patients. Uh, what's your comfort level with that? I saw that our lecture series is sorely lacking in like non-ablative talks, right? So, um, you know, I think the, the antiarrhythmic talks are good. I did a session at the ACC two years ago and Yame Cha from Mayo um, was tasked with discussing antiarrhythmics. Um, and she was like, you know, there's not very much data because we just started ablating these folks. And PVC treatment with antiarrhythmics got such a bad rap with the CAS trial that, you know, it was really difficult to imagine treating those patients. But I think the pendulum has swung again. 
If you have an MRI with no or minimal delayed enhancement, um, the PEN group has shown in a small series, I think it's about 70 patients, it's not very many, um, that, that it is safe to get flecainide. I'm not really sure that that safety signal is strong enough in such a small group of patients. That being said, with full disclosure to my referring cardiologist and full discussion with the patient, if they do not have delayed enhancement, I will use class one Cs. And I do have patients on chronic therapy that way, way as well. So it's not just as a litmus test to see if they're gonna get better and then bring them to the lab. Um, some of those patients opt to just remain on the medication. So um, I think it is a place to be, um, you're out on a limb. I don't think there's a great supporting data, but um, I think in the MRI era, uh, I feel more comfortable with that, that it's not gonna be prorhythmic. Okay, great. And then there was one question about adjusting power time and impedance when you're using half normal saline. What settings do you adjust when you're in the CS or even in the cardioly? Yeah, we definitely need a lecture on ablation physics. Um, so I need um, one of the guys who, who do those talks all the time. Um, the coronary sinus, and I didn't go through all this. I think Jason went through some of it. The coronary sinus can be a very difficult place to ablate itself. So the impedance of, is often very, very high and you have to sort of um, override all of the controls in the system to even come on. I tend to come on very low power, so 10 watts, even without half normal saline, just uh, even normal saline. Um, uh, because if you come on too high, 20 or 30 watts, you immediately get uh, an impedance rise often, and that'll cut you off. Um, so I'll start very slow, and after 20 or 30 seconds, titrate up. And I tend to do very long lesions in this area if I'm not right at at the optimal site. So two and three minutes and sometimes up to five minutes. Um, with half normal, I would definitely start with that lower power, but you need to ramp up still relatively early in the lesion. Otherwise you're going to limit your ability to penetrate tissue from sort of our current understanding of energy delivery. Um, so you're gonna get edema and swelling um, at sort of a, a superficial level. So if you're trying to get deep, you need to start giving those higher powers. I end up using half normal on the endocardium sort of site opposite those coronary sinus activation points a lot in redo procedures where we've just given as much as we can. Remember, we're not actually, um, you know, abutting the muscle or abutting the vein and there's interstitium and then there's muscle below us. We've got a lot of reasons why, especially in a redo procedure, that you might have impedance barriers to energy delivery. And so you have to use neighboring structures to kind of help you. And that's where half normal can be helpful. 